Um, my name is Adam Hathaway. I'm a solution architect with the Health and Social Care Information Centre. Um, and if, uh, for anyone who doesn't know who that is, um, the, we, we were the coming together of the, the old NHS Information Centre and what was formerly Connecting for Health. So we've sort of inherited um, a lot of the stuff around data collections, but also a lot of the big national systems um, that you're very familiar with around the, the spine and, and, and so on. Um, so we've, we've been involved in obviously um, information sharing and interoperability and so on for, for, for quite some time. And I personally have been sort of working in that space for sort of probably four or five years now. Um, so I just wanted to talk you through from probably from a slightly more te technical focus um, than the previous uh, WebEx. Um, a bit around the information sharing and so on, and you've already seen the learning objectives, which I won't read through again. Um, there's quite a bit of content, but um, I'll fly through it fairly quickly, so hopefully we'll get a little bit of time at the end for some questions and discussion. Um, I thought I'd just start with a bit of a definition. So this, this term interoperability is used a lot, um, and it's, it's, it's often misused, to be honest, but the, the, the definition I tend to use is it's the ability to safely share and make use of shared information and services, regardless of the systems in use and who supplied them. So it's, 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 it's things working together, and that's not just about information sharing. It's about functionality. It's about how it's presented. So interoperability in its entirety is much wider than just sending information between point A and point B. Um, and, if, and, and on this slide, you can see there's a bit of a breakdown of some of the sorts of ways that you could, you could sort of break that down. Um, so we've got a bit around how information is presented, so the presentation of information. Uh, and there's, there's quite a lot of work that's gone on around the, some of the professional bodies um, that you're probably familiar with around the clinical headings um, work that's been happening. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of work that's gone on on common user interface standards so that we can make sure that dates are presented in a standard way and the NHS number is, is, is always displayed in a certain way. So, so that's all, it's all linked in with interoperability because it's all about how having some consistency about how humans consume information. Then um, sort of on the top right of this picture, we've got the actual information itself and this, this links back to the, the, the EPAC session that some of you may have been on a couple of weeks back around information standards and trying to come up with common definitions and ways of coding and representing information that's consistent so that um, it can be safely used because we we're not taking it out of context and using it to mean something that it shouldn't be meaning. And then sort of down the bottom half um, is the area that I'll probably be focusing on slightly more in this session, which is the application and technical bits. So the application is around functionality, um, workflows that flow across different systems, uh, and some of the sort of patterns around the integration of systems. And then obviously the, techni the technical side is the, the boxes and wires and the, the networks and encryption and all the sorts of stuff that you have to have under the covers to make these things work, um, which you'll be glad to know I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about. Um, so, so as I said, the main focus of the session is, the, is more the, the, the application and technical sort of aspects. Um, so a good starting point, I think, when, you look, when you're thinking about interoperability and information sharing is to start thinking about what kind of level and what, what, what scope of sharing are you looking at? There's, there's lots of different ways of, of looking at this. So there's, there's sharing within a department, within a, within a hospital, for example. There'll be information that needs to be shared um, and things that need to interoperate. Um, then when you sort of scale that up a bit, there'll be sharing um, across all of the various systems within an organization. So if you're within an acute trust, you'll probably have a, a PaaS system, and then you'll have a number of departmental systems that all need to share information about the patients flowing through the hospital. But then when you scale up wider, and this is probably where it's slightly more of interest to, to, to this particular audience, um, you start talking about regional interoperability and you start thinking about things like, say for example, the Leeds Care Record, where, where there's an ambition to have information shared across a whole region about patients. Um, and then you can go, go even wider and start talking about information that's flowing between regions and nationally. And then you start to look at things like the summary care record and some of the big national systems. Um, and what you typically will tend to do is, as you get wider and wider scope, you'll tend to start looking at smaller and smaller data sets because realistically, it's unlikely you're going to want to share absolutely every detail recorded in every clinical system with someone at the other end of the country. It's more likely that there's going to be a, a slightly smaller, more focused core data set that you want to share more widely. Um, and that's, that's the principle that, that, that the EPAC stuff was done on. So the, the core minimum data set that was defined as part of the end-of-life care information standard. But a lot of local implementations will store a lot more than that. But if you want to then be able to share that broadly across the country, there's a core set of information that needs to be consistent, which will be a subset probably of each of the individual systems. But it's the, the stuff that everybody agrees on and everybody wants. And that's really the key is getting that, that nub. What's that core information that you want to share? 
so that's that's a good sort of way to, to start thinking about these things um, and start to scope out what kind of sharing you want to do and what kind of level of detail you want to, to be sharing that information in. The next scary, scary looking slide. So the next thing that's useful to do is to then, based on the sort of scope of, and, and scale of what you're trying to share, is start to map out what, what's already there, what's already in place. And this is a picture that I drew working with a particular area of the country. Um, and this is actually the, all of the key systems in, in place across the various organizations in that, in that region. Um, I've kind of anonymized it just for, for, to protect the innocent, but the, um, it gives you an idea. And, and it, it, it's, it's easy to underestimate how important this, this is because until you go out and find out what's out there, you don't realize quite often what you've already got. So there's, there's quite a lot of things on this picture, um, lots of systems, lots of arrows between the systems, which are all of the existing information flows. Um, and it really gives you a good idea once you start to sit and map that out of, of what, what, you can, what you've already got and what you can start to build on. Um, because typically you're not starting from a blank sheet of paper. There'll be a, a whole load of systems there which will have a whole load of information that you need. So you really need to, to start to get to grips with what's there, what already can flow, and then how you can build on that. Um, so that's a really useful sort of starter um, to, get, to get you going. Um, then starting the, ne the next sort of thing, I guess, would be to then start thinking about, well, what, what do we need to add to that? What, what new information flows do we need to sort of, linking back to that vision of what, what kind of scale we want to share things, but what specific stuff do we need to share? Um, and this would need to be driven by your, your local or regional kind of priorities. Um, and, and I guess um, around this the, the, the sort of group on this call, it's probably going to be uh, a number of areas around long-term condition, sharing of care plans, end-of-life care, flagging, child protection, there'll be a whole range of things that you want to consider. Um, and and it's a, once you start to sort of break those down, you can then start to establish who, who you need to speak to and, and, and then break, um, build some links with the clinical, the clinical um, teams in the various organizations and start to map out what, who needs to be involved and what do we need to share. Um, and that's really what's kind of on the next slide, which I'll come on to. But there's a couple of points on here that are worth noting. So there isn't a single, there generally won't be a single silver bullet solution that's going to solve all this. Uh, I think a, a mistake that's been made by some some organizations in the past is thinking they can just go out and buy something and it will solve their problem. Um, generally, it's not quite that simple. Uh, you've got to remember, if you go back to that previous slide, you've already got all this stuff. Just buying something else and adding it in is unlikely to just suddenly make this all work and join up. So there isn't a single silver bullet solution. You need to understand what you've got, what you want, what you need, and what you want to flow, and then start to evolve your solutions, your current solutions, towards that. And potentially, if you need to buy new components to make that work, then then fine. But you need to do that in a controlled way. So once you've got, got your high-level needs sort of um, established, and you've got some high-level vision, you can then start to build a bit of a roadmap and prioritize it. And you might want to then break down in a bit more detail what some of, the, some of these information flows might look like. Um, and this is where you really need to get sort of the, the clinical uh, communities involved, um, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to be using this. Um, well, I guess the health and social care community, not just clinical, but the, the various stakeholders involved. And, this, and again, this is a picture that I drew a few years back now. Um, won't be won't be correct now, but it gives you a general idea. Um, so you can start to map out in fairly simple terms who are the who are the different teams and uh, individuals who are going to be involved in this, what kind of information are they recording, and where do you want that to flow to? Um, who needs to be able to see it? Who needs to be able to update it? All of that stuff is the sort of stuff you need to really bottom out so that you can then start to understand well. If I, if I need these people to see it and I need these people to update it, what do I need? What does that mean for the systems that they're using, and what does that mean for the new, the new things I need to put in place to make that work? And that really then starts to get you down to the level where you can start to plan out how you might then do it, um, which is the next piece. So this, and that's where I, I wanted to introduce this this concept of patterns, which um, you may or may not have come across before, but it, it's kind of a, a term that's used quite a lot in in the IT world, and it's it's really just a way of documenting a a solution to a certain kind of problem. Um, so it's, it's, they're generally fairly, fairly abstract, and, and the idea being that you can pick a number of different patterns and apply them to, to give you an idea of how you might go about solving your problem. But as I said, they're, they're, they're generally fairly abstract, so it's not something you can just implement. Um, they're not mutually exclusive, so any real-world system will probably be fairly complex and will probably support a number of different patterns and approaches. Um, so, so it's not a case of you just go and buy a system that does X. It's, it's 
a little bit more nuanced than that, but it, it's really just a way of giving you some ideas of the sorts of approaches that you might want to look at, at, at investigating and then working with the, the system suppliers and, and, and anyone else you need to work with to make that happen. Um, typically, the, 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 there's a range of different um, patterns that meet different sorts of problems. Um, so, and you may start off with some fairly simple patterns and then evolve to some of the more complex ones later. And, and this is all part of building the roadmap, and making sure that you've got, you're progressively building the capabilities that you need over time. Um, and, and equally, some, some of these patterns will scale better than others. Um, so if I give you an example of some, some sort of information sharing patterns, and I'm not going to, I mean, I could do another whole half hour session just explaining these, so I'm not gonna, but I'm not going to do that, you'd be glad to hear. Um, but there, there is a link at the bottom of this page to more information, but just as a very quick sort of summary of, of some of the sorts of things that, that you might look at. So single shared applications should be fairly self-explanatory. So this is used fairly widely in, say, GP and community. Quite often people will use things like EMIS or System 1 where it's a single shared application with different modules for different care settings. So you get interoperability and shared functionality by virtue of the fact that everyone's using the same system. Um, there'll be, as I say, there'll be different modules that tailor it for different environments, but, but the, the information sharing and interoperability comes from the fact that everyone's using the same application. So that's, you know, that, that's great, that, that works, but it, it will only take you so far um, because there'll always probably be people who don't want to use that application or there'll be some reason why you don't want to use that for every care setting. Um, so that's where you have to start looking at some of these other patterns. Um, and I'll just, I'll just say, I'm not going to sit and just to read them all out, but we've got click through, so that allows you to transfer a user from one system to another in the context of a patient. Um, so if, anyone, if any of you have used the summary care record one click um, application, um, then, then that's an example of a click through. So you're in a, a particular system and you've got a patient record open, you click a link and it opens, another, it opens that same record in another system. Um, so fairly crude, but it can be quite effective. You've got point to point sending, so things like discharge summaries and things uh, traditionally would be done this way as a point to point message from one point, one place to another. Um, you can sort of use brokers to help uh, make it easier to route and transform information and do things like that. Uh, we've got portals which bring together a, a view of information that's actually held in lots of other systems. Um, notifications, so the, the store and notify one is one that came up as part of the EPACS work as being quite a popular one around. You have a central repository and whenever information is, is created or updated in there, you send notifications out to say the um, ambulance service or out of hours services so that they know that there's some information there and then they might use say a click through to, to click through and see it. But a shared, shared repository, so that an example of this might be the PDS, the National Demographics Service, is a shared repository that you can, various systems can synchronize with. Um, and then registry repository, which is um, allowing you to have basically an index of where information is held across a number of systems. So having said I wasn't going to stand, sit here and read them all out, I just have, so I shall move on. Um, as I said, as I think I mentioned, a number of, especially as you get to some of the more advanced and mature patterns, there's, there's generally going to be a number of sort of technical capabilities and moving into that technology space that you need to have under the, under, under the hood, as it were, to make some of these work. And, and I'm not, and I'm really not going to read all these ones out, but there's the whole range of things that you need to start thinking about um, to make some of these patterns work. So single sign-on, if you've got lots of different systems, you don't want lots of different logins and passwords, so you want some kind of single sign-on. Um, um, you can't actually see my mouse pointer, so you'll just have to imagine me pointing at them as, as we go around. We've got role-based access controls. Um, there's a whole load of directory stuff that you're probably going to want to have, so that if you're referring to organizations and, and people in, in, in the information that you're sending around, that you've got a consistent definition of those organizations, and you can refer to them using a code or something. You've got um, endpoints. Um, so that you know where to send the information to, so you can look up a, a, an actual address on the network, so you know where to send things. You've got down at the bottom right, there's PKI, PKI which is um, public, key um, public key infrastructure, which is around encryption. So if you want to send something between two different systems, you want to do so securely, and you need a con common way of identifying that that is the system you think it is, and you can encrypt it, and all that kind of stuff. So there's a whole load of under underpinning sort of technology capabilities that you would need to start to think about. Um, and as you start to scale up the sharing of information across larger and larger regions, you need more and more of these services to be shared so that you can start to do that. Um, so that's sort of the, the technical bit. So that's as technical as it's going 
yeah, don't worry. Um, the, the other point to make is that you know it's not it's not realistic to just sort of map all this out and then just sort of go and expect to be able to just do it all in one go. So you really need to start to pri prioritize your information flows, start to figure out what kinds of patterns you can use in the short, medium, and long term, and, and what the, the direction of travel should be, so you can start to build the capabilities in all of the, the existing systems. You can buy any new systems that you need to buy. You can work with us and others to, to look at what national stuff you can hook into. Um, so, and this slide's gone a bit wrong at the bottom, but uh, as an example, you might start with some fairly simple uh, solution where you, you have some notifications when content, is, say, care plans are created, um, and then the other systems that you're notifying can just give a link to click through to view that care plan. You might then move towards a, a shared repository so that all of the care plans can be put in, in, in one central system and people can re retrieve them from there. Um, and then I can't read the other boxes, but I think the final one is you might then put in place a registry so that you can then start to register information about where care plans are held in other parts of the country and other registries, for example. So you can imagine there's a number of sort of steps getting more and more mature as you go forward. Um, but being pragmatic and building that piece by piece as you go as you go along. Um, so that's the roadmap piece. In terms of nationally what's available, there's a there is a range of things, some of which you I'm sure you're aware of. So we've got the N three network within the health area, which um, over time will evolve into the HSCN, the health and social care network. So that'll bring in social care as well. So there's there's secure networking capabilities in place now which will hopefully evolve and, and grow. We've got secure email that I'm sure you're familiar with in just now. We've got national capabilities around the single sign-on piece, which is the smart cards. Um, we've got the, the National Demographic Service, PDS. We've got the National Summary Care Record, which, which stores medications, allergies, and adverse reactions in a big national repository that you can integrate your systems with. Um, we've got GP to GP for, for allowing information to flow point to point between GP systems. Um, Choose and Book, um, which is going to be replaced fairly shortly with the a new e-referrals service, um, which is primarily at the moment for referring from primary into secondary care, but I think over the longer term that may well broaden out to cover other forms of electronic referrals. Um, we've got electronic prescribing, uh, there's the child protection information system which has fairly recently been launched which allows social care to share information about children who are um, under child protection and make that available to health services so that they can be aware of that. Um, and then we've got the um, Secondary uses stuff, so the whole whole raft of services that uh, HSCIC offer around data collections and statistics and so on. Um, and some of the stuff you may not be aware of around standards, we've got. I mean, you've probably heard of the coding stuff around SNOMED, um, read code and so on, and that's all maintained by by us nationally. Um, and then there's a whole range of information standards, and, and obviously the, the end of life care information standards that, we, that if you were on the, the session a couple of weeks back, you'll be familiar with now, but there's a whole range of other information standards to start to bring some standardization to that information part. Um, and then around interoperability and some of the, the, the messaging piece, we've got ITK, which is the Interoperability Toolkit, which I'll come on to in a bit more detail in a second. And then there's a, number, a whole raft of other standards around technical safety and security and so on. So there's quite a lot available nationally, and a lot of this you'd find on the HSCIC website, and um, NHS England have got involvement with a lot of that as well. Just to briefly sort of expand on the interoperability toolkit piece then, because I think that's probably quite a pertinent one for this discussion. So um, this is something that's been around for a few few years now, um, and it's despite the name, it's not really a thing. It's not a toolkit per se. It's really a set of standards and guidance um, around um, messaging, electronic messaging between systems. So it's all about systems sending information between, between themselves, between each other. Um, and it has an accreditation scheme with it. So one of the ITK specifications, for example, is around the end-of-life care information in the information standard, and it provides a formal specification for how you would send that electronically between two systems. And then there's an accreditation scheme. So if, if two systems want to be able to share EPAC data, they can build to those specifications, and then they can come to us and we'll accredit them. Um, to, to sort of accredit that they have followed the specification and that they can interoperate. And then there's a, an accreditation catalog on our website, which, which you can have a look at, and that shows you all of the suppliers and what exactly they've been accredited for. The idea being that it makes it a lot easier for you when you're procuring services to understand where there is already some interoperability capabilities in that product um, 
so that you can then um, have a, a reasonable level of confidence that um, if you've got two systems that say that they can share information according to the ITGA specifications, they should be able to interoperate. Um, so that that's that's to try, that, that was really an aim to try and move us away from every individual point-to-point -point sharing of information having to be built from as fresh and paid for afresh. So each each time two organisations want to share some information, they were having to pay the suppliers again to do that, and then the next people had to then pay them again to do another bespoke interface. Um, so it was really to try and make that that um, whole process a bit less painful um, and hopefully uh, less costly for for the NHS. Um, so that's the ITK piece, uh, and again, that's, that's bit, there's loads of information about that on our website. Um, and if the links aren't in this slide deck, I'll make sure they get distributed after. Um, another piece of work that's kicked off um, fairly recently is um, something that's being led by NHS England um, to put together a broader framework for interoperability, covering some of those other domains, those other aspects that I talked about at the start. Um, and they've sort of come up with this, this layered model, uh, which is on the slide here, which I won't, I won't read through. But um, they, they're working with us and others to, to sort of use this to build up a suite of guidance and resources, um, also to identify whether there's any new national standards or services that are required. Um, so it, it, it's a fairly long-term piece of work, but it's, it's, the work is ongoing. And um, I know for a fact that they're, they're working on some handbooks and some guidance and so on, which I would hope will be available fairly soon. So that's that's one to keep an eye on. I think there will be some very useful um, collateral coming out of that, which should help. Um, and that's it.